Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, while we give everybody a moment to join, um, I invite you to open up the chat and tell us where you're joining from. Let's see where our friends are from today. You guys know the drill. Troy, New York. That's not too far from me right here in Albany. New Haven, New York City, Aberdeen, Maryland. Hi, Mark. Who's the furthest away today? Rochester, LaGrange down by Poughkeepsie, Buffalo. Amherst by Buffalo. Good afternoon to you. Warm, sunny Orlando. Hi, Ken. Abbotsville, British Columbia. Hi, Hilda. In the woodlands in Texas, wonderful. Montreal, Quebec, Dallas, Texas, Berkeley, California, Los Angeles, Lyme, Connecticut, Houston. We got folks from all over. What a cosmopolitan group we have today. Hi, my name is Rich Merritt and I'm your host today. This webinar is brought to you by the uh, Audubon State Offices of Connecticut, New York, whose mission it is to protect birds and, and the places that we all need in our forests, on the coasts and across local communities. Uh, a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and it'll soon be available uh, on our YouTube and Facebook pages. Questions are welcome in the chat box at any time, and we'll have time at the end for questions and answers. Um, today's webinar is about how nature can help us adapt to the threats of climate change. And to facilitate the conversation, I introduce um, Allison Sant. Uh, one moment. Allison is partner and co-founder of the Studio for Urban Projects, an interdisciplinary design collaborative based in San Francisco that works at the intersection of architecture, urbanism, art, and social activism. For more than 15 years, the studio has focused on public programming, urban prototyping, and civic dialogue, aiming to bring social justice and sustainability to the design of cities. And Allison is the author of From the Ground Up, Local Efforts to Create, to create Resilient Cities, a new book that examines how American cities are mitigating and adapting to climate change while creating greater equity and livability. Hi, Allison. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to thank Rich and the Audubon Society for hosting this panel, and then to all of you in our audience for attending today. Um, I'll start with an overview of From the Ground Up, and then I'll introduce our other panelists, Jessica Dandridge and Robin Grossinger, for a discussion. From the Ground Up examines how cities around the country are mitigating and adapting to climate change while creating equitable and livable communities in the process. Today, our discussion will focus on efforts to advance nature adaptation from our watersheds to our coastlines. As scientists have made clear, climate change is an urgent problem. We have less than eight years to halve carbon emissions and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius just to avoid the worst of its effects. But many of us have experienced its effects already from wildfires and extreme heat to severe storms and flooding. And we know that climate change exaggerates existing systemic inequities as communities are disproportionately exposed to its impacts. And it's not just people that are entangled by our changing climate. As many of you in the audience are well aware, the rates of extinction alone will mean that without action, our kids and grandkids will not experience the biodiversity that we enjoy today. According to an Audubon study, 314 species of North American birds may lose more than 50% of their current climatic range by 2080, putting two thirds of them at increased risk of extinction. The choices we make today will profoundly affect the future. Cities are the place to act. Together, the world's cities are responsible for 75% of global carbon emissions. They're also the places where the majority of us live as the world's population has tipped to urban. How we live in cities matters. For example, transportation is responsible for 29% of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, with the majority of that number attributed to passenger cars. When we reclaim our streets from cars to create safe places to walk and bike and more efficient public transit for everyone, we lower carbon emissions while creating greater equity. When we tear up the concrete to create green streets, rain gardens, and floodable parks to slow storm water, we're preventing extreme floods while making the places that we live more lush and alive. We're creating urban wildlife corridors and neighborhoods that are green by mimicking nature's processes. And we can do this work by providing jobs and greater economic security to communities that have been historically under-resourced. When we plant cities with street trees and expand our urban tree canopy, we're sequestering carbon, reducing air pollution, and cooling our streets. We are also making cities more biodiverse. 
Even in places as urban as New York City, successful efforts like the Million Trees Campaign have helped to provide refuge for millions of migrating birds every spring and fall. When we adapt our shorelines by restoring wetlands or installing oyster reefs and other nature-based solutions, we're buffering future storms in frontline communities while supporting coastal habitats. And as From the Ground Up describes, this work is already underway in cities across the country. When I began writing this book, I understood the ways in which our historical ecology often affects how cities and neighborhoods fare in extreme weather. Predictably, it in severe storms, it floods in areas that were once wetlands, marshes, and stream beds. What became more vivid to me as I researched this book is how people are impacted in extreme weather is equally shaped by the history of systemic racism in this country. Due to discriminatory policies like redlining and restrictive covenants, race is too often correlated with where people live in cities, what elevation they live at, what temperatures they're exposed to, and what resources they have access to in times of emergency. As a result, climate change disproportionately affects under-resourced communities and communities of color. For example, New Orleans is a city defined through its relationship to water, wound around the curves of the Mississippi River, flanked by Lake Pontchartrain to the north and Lake Bourne to the east, built through bayous and wetland marshes and penetrated by shipping canals. Water is everywhere. 49% of the city lies below sea level. As the city grew, discriminatory development policies have condensed its black population in lower elevations, such as the seventh, eighth, and upper ninth wards. This had devastating effects during Hurricane Katrina. New Orleans black population made up 76% of its flood victims. And this pattern is statewide. Across Louisiana, more than 65,000 people living below six feet are socially vulnerable, the vast majority of which are people of color. And those living on the front lines have limited resources to respond or recover from natural disasters. Today, Louisiana loses one football field of wetlands approximately every hour and a half. 70% of wetlands loss is due to the infrastructure of extraction. These processes ravage coastal marshlands as canals are dug for access, holes are bored for exploration, and pipelines laid across fragile ecosystems. Almost 2,000 square miles of Louisiana's wetlands have disappeared, and without action, more than 4,000 could be lost by 2070. Land loss continues to be one of the greatest threats to bird habitat as marshes are inundated. Louisiana rank ranks first in population among many bird species, including the state bird, the brown pelican, which has recovered from near extinction. The state supports more than half of the global population of seaside sparrows and the Cabot sandwich tern, birds found in salt marshes. The population of black skimmers, a beach nesting species, has been reduced to 30% of what it was in the 1970s. Efforts to protect Louisiana's remaining wetlands advanced in the bipartisan coastal master plan will be crucial to the survival of these species. But land loss is already forcing some communities to move and others to densify in order to receive them. Louisiana's strategic adaptations for future environments are LA safe, is a co-design process developed with six parishes on the, on the front lines in Louisiana. The insights of community members were used to create crowd source land use maps that prioritize future investments in low, mid, and high risk areas. Low risk areas develop resilient ho housing prototypes and green streets to accommodate increasing populations. Moderate risk areas created shoreline parks and those in, high, in the high risk category implemented nature preserves and the growth of ecotourism. In April of 2019, community members in all six parishes selected 10 catalytic prototypes to be funded, all of which are being implemented today. LA is Safe makes the case that even in the most challenging of circumstances, there are efforts underway that provide bold examples of how we can adapt. We often think that complicated problems like global climate change need to be solved by powerful governments, their plans, policies, and regulations, and they do. The Clean Water Act is a great example of a policy that regulates pollution and has supported green infrastructure in cities across the country. It's been a critical tool in cleaning our urban waters, restoring watersheds in cities, and providing fish and wildlife habitat. But for those policies to succeed, the opposite is also true. The most effective solutions are born out of the communities they serve. We need both. Communities must lead the solutions ahead and be supported by government policies and funding in doing so. 
For example, in New Orleans post-Hurricane Katrina, Angela Chalk, Executive Director of Healthy Community Services in the Seventh Ward, worked with Waterwise Gulf South to help direct investments in her neighborhood. With volunteers, she created a green infrastructure demonstration in her own yard. And when the next storm hit and she didn't flood, her neighbors were interested in the same remedies. Knowing her neighbors and her neighborhood, she brought people together to learn about how green infrastructure works and how it complements the complex network of levees, pumps, and canals throughout the city. Now the neighborhood has entire blocks of demonstration projects. And the seventh ward is part of a network of the neighborhood waterwise champions a training program which connects local knowledge and technical information about green infrastructure. As Angela said in our interview, now people can tell you about native plants. They can tell you about the capacity of a cypress tree to hold water or clean the air. Everybody's a green infrastructure specialist now. Community-led approaches are being expanded upon as plans to create the Gentilly Resilience District and neighbor, a network of permeable parks Green Streets and Stormwater Corridors is underway. Among them is St. Anthony Green Streets, in which residents are sharing local knowledge to inform the project's design. These efforts are being supported by a network of lo local advocacy groups, including the Water Collaborative, which Jessica directs, to build this capacity in communities throughout the city. Although this work is far from complete, the process of creating greater water literacy through training programs, public education, and community dialogue can shape the future of New Orleans and create the opportunity for communities to help develop solutions to flooding, weigh the consequences of climate change, and direct the future of their city. Examples of projects like those in New Orleans describe how often experiments need to start small and scale successes. This is also true for many other examples in the book. In New York, public school students involved in the Billion Oyster Project are restoring the harbor and buffering future storms by growing oysters and monitoring reefs while gaining job skills and environmental literacy. Pilot projects started by testing locations for oyster reefs in places like Soundview Park in the Bronx. And today Soundview is one of the largest restored oyster habitats in the estuary. The lessons learned there have informed other pilot projects, including near the former Tappan Zee Bridge, where oysters are now thriving. And oysters are also part of the new living breakwaters for Staten Island being built today. The use of oysters in living shorelines is also underway in the San Francisco Bay where scientists like Catherine Boyer and her team are experimenting with reef systems for growing the native Olympia oyster and eelgrass, which provide nat natural habitat for fish, aquatic plants and wildlife. As sea levels rise, this restoration work buffers storms and storm surges along the, the shoreline especially in low-lying communities like the Canal District in San Rafael, home to a majority of Latinx residents. Living Shorelines experiments are being replicated throughout the San Francisco Bay in San Rafael, Hayward, Richmond, Sausalito, and Bayview Hunters Point. This work is being permitted by BCDC, the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, which regulates the development of the San Francisco Bay shoreline. BCDC's Fill for Habitat Bay Plan Amendment now allows for the experimentation necessary to build pilot projects and scale their successes. To keep up with sea level rise, 100,000 acres of wetlands will need to be restored in the Bay. To coordinate these efforts, the San Francisco Bay Shoreline Adaptation Atlas, which Robin worked on at SFEI, recommends nature-based strategies throughout the Bay. Like the Canal District in San Rafael, many of the Bay Area's lowest lying communities are also its most vulnerable populations. Acknowledging that BCDC has served a role in permitting industries that, industries that have polluted communities of color, the environmental justice and social equity amendment to the Bay Plan attempts to remedy these past injustices. Written in partnership with local community-based organizations, it aims to protect under-resourced communities and requires their participation in future development. These efforts illustrate that climate action is an opportunity to create more equitable and livable communities. BCDC policies are informing the development of the India Basin Shoreline Park to create a 64 acre network of parklands and open spaces running through the Bayview Hunters Point in the south part of San Francisco. Historically, the Bayview has the highest rates of home ownership among black people, but has suffered from generations of environmental injustice and neglect for basic infrastructure. Today, the development of shoreline parks is creating an opportunity for long-term residents to envision the future of their neighborhood and economically participate in the investments being made there. On the final stretch of undeveloped land along the India Basin shoreline, ambitious plans for the India Basin shoreline park are underway. 
Once complete, the park will feature a pier serving as a boat launch, an outdoor classroom for students to study the bay's ecosystems. Salt marshes along the park's edge feature tidal wetlands, coastal scrub, grasslands, and beaches, providing habitat and a natural buffer to sea level rise. The park is not only a future opportunity, but one that's being played out now to ensure that the park serves the long-term residents of Bayview Hunters Point. A community leadership community has, has been established, including residents who have been historically underrepresented in the planning process and who are now leading efforts to ensure a different future. Together, the, communities, the committee has created the Equitable Development Plan, addressing how the park's development will catalyze economic opportunities, promote workforce development, create housing security, and support community health for Bayview's residents, all while restoring the natural ecology of the shoreline. And as Jacqueline Flynn, the executive director of the A. Philip Randall, Randolph Institute said, we're ensuring that the residents and the families that have lived here for so long still have the opportunity to thrive in this neighborhood. From the ground up is a call to action. When we make the places we live more porous, lush, and alive, we also make them socially just, resilient, and self-directed. Armed with inventive experiments, decades of best, best practices, and clear data, we have the chance to create thriving, just, and nourishing places to live. And we must. Our resiliency will have much to do with how inevitable change is taken as an opportunity. Cities remake themselves in pieces. There are opportunities with every road that is redesigned, sidewalk that is planted, Open space, open space that is forested, and shoreline that is restored to interject a new idea about how people live in urban spaces and who benefits from them. There are massive changes ahead. Let's make sure they're the ones we wanna live with. In the writing of From the Ground Up, I interviewed more than 90 people who generously shared their experiences and insights with me. And I feel very lucky to have two of those experts with me here today to talk about their work. I'd like to welcome Jessica Dandridge and Robin Grossinger. As the Executive Director of the Water Collaborative of Greater New Orleans, Jessica Dandridge has dedicated her life to community advocacy and campaign development for an organization seeking to be socially, economically, and culturally inclusive. Through socially innovative engagement strategies, Jessica has cultivated spaces for learning and the advancement of campaigns through collaboration, risk management, and resource mobilization. Robin Grossinger is a senior scientist at the San Francisco Estuary Institute. He works with city staff, NGOs, and communities on urban ecological design and climate, climate, climate resilience work sorry, that is featured in the UN Habitat Global Urban Lecture and has been covered by media from National Public Radio to the New York Times. Thank you both for joining me. I'll stop this. Oops. So you both come from very unique Delta regions. I'd like to start first by having you each introduce the places you live and the strategies your organizations use to promote urban resilience in the region. So maybe we'll start with Jessica and then go to Robin. Thank you, Allison, and thank you again, uh, Audubon Society, for having me. Um, so I live here in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm actually in the heart of the city right now in a historic Treme neighborhood. Um, and New Orleans uh, is a part of the Delta uh, or the Mississippi River Delta. Um, and New Orleans specifically is also known as Bobancha, the land of many tongues, and home to over 25 tribes um, that have moved or uh, been removed, unfortunately. Um, but the culture here is, is really, really strong. Um, and Allison, I'm sorry, can you repeat that second part of your question again? Oh, yeah, I'm interested in knowing more about the strategies that both of your organizations use to work on in these unique landscapes and to promote urban resilience. Yeah, thank you. Just wanted sure. to make sure. <laughs> um, so um, the Water Collaborative of Greater New Orleans uh, just briefly was started um, 2013, 2014 um, as a literally a grassroots movement amongst unlikely cohorts of engineers, architects, uh, urban planners, uh, government agencies who really realized that New Orleans relationship with water wasn't working. Um, and so from there, uh, they really tried to bring uh, concepts around living with water and thriving with water together and actually move the city of New Orleans and hopefully Southeast Louisiana together 
towards a more resilient future in regards to climate change, as well as natural erosion that we're seeing, um, that we would see from uh, great infrastructure, um, as well as uh, you know, human life that we, we, we normally live here. Um, the strategies for the Water Collaborative are three prongs. One is education. So the first thing that we do is try to make sure that our residents are educated on the issues that we're seeing in uh, climate mitigation, climate resilience, green infrastructure, stormwater management, and so on. Um, the reason why is that people here in New Orleans really don't understand what's going on when it, goes, when it comes to uh, water management. Myself, uh, who was born and raised here in Louisiana, we didn't talk about what levees do. We didn't talk about what the canals do or the drainage system. We were just told that we wanna keep the water out but we never really knew why. As we are uh, now really understanding the larger depth of that, we understand that most residents here don't really have a good concept on how it works and why certain things are better than others. So our job is to really help educate. We call it wholesale education here at the Water Collaborative because we're not focused on curriculum or K through 12, we're focused on residents. The second thing we do is policy work. We really try to uh, ensure that the policies and the concepts that are, are at the core of the Water Collaborative are present in local, state, and federal policies, which has been really effective from building the stormwater code to seeing uh, more work around the watershed initiative um, at the state level. And lastly, again, with the Infrastructure Jobs Act, including green infrastructure, as many other things in the current policies. And then lastly, but certainly not least, is equity. So we really focus on trying to get residents as part of the workforce. One of the benefits of green infrastructure and stormwater management is that it is, can be inclusive of many, many sectors and many, many different backgrounds and professionals, or you don't even have to be a professional. Um, you can be a part of the workforce and you can start in an entry level job at $15 an hour. And we also see people who are coming from different things such as teaching um, or uh, art and culture being a part of this movement. Um, and the reason why we really focus on that is because we see stormwater management and green infrastructure as part of a movement to be socially and economically liberating for people here in New Orleans who have experienced decades, if not centuries in many cases of, 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 of corruption and unfortunately a lot of racial discrimination in regards to urban planning policy. We see green infrastructure as a way to kind of flip the, 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 the narrative and help residents be a part of this process to make New Orleans uh, a more resilient place as well as Louisiana. So that was a long, I hope that wasn't too long, Allison, but That's great. Try to Thank you, and, and Robin, to you too. Can you describe the, the Bay Area and, and SFEI's work here? Yeah, sure, thanks, Allie. And, um, and by the way, thanks for this, uh, for your fantastic book. It's very inspiring <laughs> to see all these stories from around the country, people actually doing stuff and being successful. So very uh, reassuring and inspiring. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm based in Berkeley today and uh, where I live on, you know, on the periphery of San Francisco Bay. Um, and so that's a large natural and almost completely enclosed body of water, um, you know, 50 or 60 miles um, from top to bottom. And so we have a very long shoreline um, that adds up to three or 400 miles, depending on how you how you measure it. And much of that is fairly low lying. Um, and we've, of course, built down to the edge and then well into the, the former bay in many places. So we've created a, you know, really interesting challenge um, with this, the bay essentially kind of coming back into our, into our, into where we thought we had moved the bay. We thought we made the bay smaller. And we did, we made it a third smaller. Now it's getting bigger and bigger. Um, and so we're having to you know, adjust to that and figure out how, how the, the city, the, an urban region kind of reshapes itself around a, a growing bay. So, um, so I work at the San Francisco Astro Institute, which is a, um, a science center, bioregional science center created, um, kind of like Jessica said, by a bunch of different entities, public, private, um, you know, governmental, NGO, feeling that there needed to be a central kind of uh, resource a center for trustworthy kind of independent science that would guide environmental management. So we actually engage on water quality issues and the health of the bay and rivers and, um, and um, then also have a program called Resilient Landscapes, which really is focused on resilience and ecosystem restoration. So we see our role, um, you know, our role is to improve environmental management. And so 
we're often looking for how can you bring nature-based approaches into our resilience and adaptation strategies. And so, you know, ways that we can both, you know, we're often thinking about the resilience of the ecosystem and different, you know, plant and animal communities and ecosystems and how that interfaces with our resilience as communities and neighborhoods and cities and regions. And there's, of course, a lot of synergies there. And I'd say a couple of the main areas we're focused on are the shoreline and um, kind of nature-based adaptation strategies, wetlands, beaches, uh, more naturalistic levees um, and living shorelines. And how do we integrate those things and use them to, to sort of reshape the edge of the bay or is resilient so that it makes the bay and the bay ecosystem more resilient and also protects our, our communities. And then, so that says so the shoreline, um, and then there's the cities themselves, the urban areas, and how do those become more resilient? And again, nature is a key component, um, both through trees and tree canopy as one of the major ways to reduce heat island effect. Um, and then also, as, as Jessica mentioned in Alley, to green infrastructure, um, increasing the ways that the, 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 the porosity and sort of the sponge nature of the landscape, so we're catching water and recharging it rather than creating larger floods. Um, and then how we manage our rivers and streams and watersheds. And that's really important for flooding um, and to make these corridors that are um, gonna provide resilience for species and wildlife moving around and also buffers to the rivers to prevent flooding. But then also a big piece for us is, as it is um, in New Orleans at a bigger scale, is the delivery of sediment to the bay. So how do we move dirt naturally so that it's supplying our marshes with, with enough dirt that they can grow vertically as the sea rises. So a lot of our role seems to be how to provide an interdisciplinary perspective that, um, that unites across the different sectors that, that all have pieces or roles to play in this, these solutions. Um, and we're lucky because we can think at the watershed scale or the region scale or um, kind of functional landscape units that um, cross jurisdictions and then help, help folks work on the collaborative solutions around those. And so, so we, we tend to work between the science, um, leading scientists in the region and nationally, and then very closely on a day-to-day -day level with staff at agencies and leaders at local NGOs and community groups. So we're kind of that bridge there um, bound at the boundary between science and application. So I'll pause there. That's great. Well, I'd, I'd love to get into unpack more of that um, with both of you. Um, but first I wanna ask you a little bit more about habitat. Um, this, uh, this past weekend in the New York Times, maybe both of you saw the, the, the incredible map that illustrated the areas throughout the United States where biodiversity is most at risk. And um, Robin, maybe starting with you, given that California was, um, listed in the map as the most imperiled, having the most imperiled biodiversity of any state. How, how can you think about uh, nature-based adaptation efforts? How do they, can, can they address the extinction of birds and plants and other species while helping us adapt for, for human communities? Yeah, I think they definitely have a role to play, um, you know, in, in so many ways. Um, you know, at a broad scale, we know that species need to move. You know, many, many, wild, many species like migratory birds or our Western monarch have to fly across and through our cities and they need to find resources there and, and we can provide those so that they're able to make those migrations which are increasingly challenging and complex with climate changes and loss of habitat. So we should remember, you know, that our cities are that resource for species passing through as well as species that are needing to gradually move because of climate change and may actually need to, you know, your cities are a huge barrier. And then there are many actual local residential species that, that can, can benefit from increasing habitat in the urban setting or on the periphery. Um, one obvious one that's a bird connection is that um, the salt marshes, the tidal marshes that we need so badly to reduce the impacts of, of, of wave energy on our shorelines as sea level rises. Those restoring those marshes, those are the critical habitat for the endangered ridge, ridgeways, ridgeways rail, like mm. when it's called the clapper rail better, it's easier to pronounce, <laughs> um, you know, a very rare bird species. So there's, you know, so the codependence there between an endangered species and its, its future 
and the future, our future on the shoreline is really close. Like we both need those marshes. And that continues on through, you know, bringing native trees and resilient forests into the city and making corridors through the city that are gonna be um, full of nature. And those are gonna be the cooling corridors that keep our cities cool, but those are also gonna be the places that species can thrive. And in fact, some species, you know, we can preserve in, in, the, in the hills and in the, the reserves, but many actually need the lowlands and the kind of wetland and riverine habitats where our cities are. So we do need to make space for nature in those places. And, you know, and, and the city is one of the places that we, it probably provides some of the lowest level now. So it's one of the places we actually can make a big difference, a big increase in value by changing the way we design design and kind of maintain our cities. I mean, I'm remembering too that you've also talked a little bit about how cities can be incubators for, um, for, for nature writ large, that there's experiments in cities that can happen with let's say trees or other, other um, plants that, that might not be able to happen in our, in our um, protected wildlands. So. Right, that's an interesting thing. Yeah, there's some, some looking, you know, some people have looked into What's true, what species do we use as cities? And you know, we often use a lot of non-native species or species that um, could actually become invasive into the surrounding landscape. Um, but in some cases, we're using species that actually might be from further south here in the Northern Hemisphere and um, might be more beneficial in the future to have. And so they, they could be sort of pre, you know, we're not ready to adapt it you know, assisted migration generally in most cases, but in cities we may be actually creating some, some uh, opportunities where we'll have useful species in the future rather than invasive ones. Jessica, to, um, you know, there's whole neighborhoods in New Orleans like the Gentilly Resilience District that are being created um, and, and looking at how like this, this big network of green infrastructure and parks how will that all enhance habitat for the city's urban critters? Um, well, it'll do a lot, actually. It'll do a, a huge amount. And just to kind of give a little context, New Orleans, uh, uh, from its founding in 1718, has struggled with drainage. Uh, for many, many years, they tried to figure out how to build homemade levees and build homemade drainage canals, which didn't work. Um, and by 1913, they had figured out how to properly do drainage. And we kind of took it to the extreme by building the most expansive drainage system in North America with 120 pumps that work uh, when it rains and 24 dry weather pumps that work 24-7 uh, um, to uh, artificially keep the water levels low. That also meant that uh, communities paved over everything. Um, and so if you ever have an opportunity to come to New Orleans, you'll notice we have an excessive amount of payment, but that actually uh, comes from the yellow fever epidemic where people uh, feared water, they feared grass, they feared uh, anything wetlands because they were afraid of getting yellow fever. Um, and so now as a result in the 21st century, we're seeing New Orleans has very few trees, which also 60% of our tree canopy was lost during Hurricane Katrina. Um, and then on top of that, we have a coastal um, uh, degradation that has been happening due to oil and gas, as well as uh, saltwater intrusion and sea level rise. So a lot of our e natural ecology, our, our biodiversity was stripped of, uh, of our land uh, locally. So now we're seeing a resurgence with green infrastructure as well as coastal resilience, uh, tons of biodiversity. Um, and what that means is we're seeing many more birds, but also just multiple plants and um, native plants coming back. Um, there's a huge tree planting program here uh, hosted by an organization called Soul or Sustaining Our Urban Landscape. Um, and they have a huge uh, tree planting program. And now we're seeing uh, much more biodiversity in areas that would normally not see it. I actually uh, was driving to the wetlands the other day and actually spotted four bald eagles. And I can tell you my lifetime here in New Orleans, I've never seen that many uh, in my life. And I'm 32 to be clear. So 32 years of my life and I've seen the more bald eagles then. So that's just a small example. But the goal for putting green infrastructure in is not only just to reduce heat island effects or stormwater management, it is also to increase biodiversity. And hopefully, again, the concept of living and thriving with water means living with nature and being one with it. The reason why New Orleans is sinking, it wasn't always below sea level. In fact, most of the city of New Orleans was never below sea level until the, the development of the levee system by the Army Corps of Engineers. And so we need to get back to that. But getting back to that doesn't just mean reducing flooding. It also means getting back to nature and allowing residents to be one with uh, our natural delta. 
Um, you, you mentioned living with water, and I, I know both of you have been part of advancing plans in your cities that create a new vision for how to address flooding and storm surges. And, um, and as, as living with water came out of the urban water plan in, in New Orleans, um, and, and Robin, you worked to create the San Francisco Bay Shoreline Adaptation Atlas, really guiding adaptation efforts in all nine, nine counties surrounding the Bay. So um, Robin, beginning with you, can you describe these planning efforts and how they're informing what happens on the ground? Yeah, sure, Ali, thanks. Um, yeah, so we developed a, um, a report uh, called the San Francisco Bay Shoreline Adaptation Atlas, which is subtitled Working with Nature to Plan for Sea Level Rise Using Operational Landscape Units. Um, a real catchy term, which actually has caught on, bizarrely enough, OLUs, you wouldn't think it. Um, but we developed this report with SPUR, a um, urban planning and research organization. And um, I should mention my colleagues, uh, Julie Beagle and Katie McKnight and um, Sam Safran, who were really the leads on this project. And so, you know, as I said earlier, the shoreline, we have several hundred miles of shoreline around the bay. And it, um, and we know we need to manage it somehow collectively because what you do in one part of the shoreline affects other parts. And obviously, if you just do one segment and not the neighboring ones, it's not going to work. So, and yet the shoreline is also extremely heterogeneous. It's really complex and every piece seems really different and complicated. So, so we felt a little bit of gridlock in terms of how to, how to think about that in an organized way and start working together collaboratively. So what we did was we, we looked at the natural, um, kind of natural form and function of the shoreline. Um, there are a lot of just sort of the fundamentals, if you will, um, where it's steeper, where it's shot, where it's um, flatter or lower, lower lying, um, where you used to have beaches and, um, and more um, oysters, and eelgrass kind of subtitle shorelines coming right up to, to the land, where you had broad tidal marshlands. Um, and then styles of development, you know, where the freeway is really close, where it's further away, where you have, um, you know, different types of urban density and um, different types of infrastructure patterns. And we were able to come up with kind of a system of organizing and dividing up the, the shoreline into about 30 natural units, these operational landscape units that are five to 10 miles long. So they're actually still decent size, but they're a manageable size. And the idea is that these these have similar characteristics and we won't need to work together in these to design our solutions, um, you know, piece by piece over time. And so now um, with that um, collective vision and many scientists and agency staff were involved in that, now we're in the position where we can start in each region um, and then zoom in and come up with more detailed strategies. And so that's taking place both, I would say at a county scale where a county um, like a Marin County or San Mateo County will have several OLUs and is coming up with a strategy more zoomed in of, of how to, um, you know, where the immediate actions and longer term actions or zooming in even further and developing an OLU specific strategy. Or you can use it from the other direction if you have a project, to, you know, which is often how, you know, we're working in is a particular funding opportunity or a project moves ahead. So you can see what's the context in which that project wants to be designed and what are the other kind of players that should be engaged and what's the general vision for that area. So now, we, yes, yeah, so we're developing these different the zoomed in strategies then for how we move forward in those different places. And I would say, um, you know, and I guess part of the intention there too is to understand the underlying natural processes, um, you know, and, and what still exists to sustain um, nature and, and the, the benefits nature can provide and, and help us really maximize the use of those because um, they vary what you can do in different places. And we really want to take advantage of that. There's, there's certain places you can do marshes, certain places you can do beaches, um, horizontal levees, um, places where we probably should try to move back a little bit if we can, um, places where we need to come up with different policy structures. So that's given us a framework that but it is only just a framework. Now, the hard part, of course, is actually moving forwards and coming up with those plans, um, having those have collective involvement <clears throat> and engagement from all different parts of society, um, particularly some of the folks who haven't been involved as much as Jessica been saying in designing these places. Um, so 
that's where I say agencies like BCDC and um, and some of the other groups that have kind of formed both locally and regionally are really moving things forward. Okay. And and Jessica, maybe you could talk a little bit about living with water and the urban water plan as a maybe the first step in setting that vision, but also if you could connect it to, to public education and, and kind of the broader scope of water literacy as well. Absolutely. So the my organization was actually created out of the urban water plan and to kind of back up a little bit, I mean, I actually saw some one of the questions mentioned uh, the Netherlands. Um, so the Dutch dialogues, um, and some of you may be familiar with that happened first where professionals in the field uh, went after Hurricane Katrina and said, well, we need to, as I mentioned, manage water uh, in a different way. Um, and that means not pushing water away with being one with, with, with water. And so we went, or not we, they <laughs> uh, went to the Netherlands and I really learned a lot uh, from the Dutch and how do we actually uh, live with water. But then when we came back, um, we also realized that their process is great, but it works great for them. How can we retrofit this for New Orleans? Because New Orleans and Southeast Louisiana is a complex place um, with uh, hundreds of bayous, swampland, riverways. Um, obviously, the Mississippi River is a driving force of that and multiple um, marshlands. And so how do we actually take some of that and bring that into that, especially considering uh, we have a huge diverse population and not only African-American, but obviously we have a huge, uh, the Cajun population, which is uh, actually um, refugees from, from Nova Scotia, which is they live off the land and, and they do a lot of trapping and hunting. That is uh, really important to the, not only Louisiana ecosystem or economic system, but also America's uh, economy. And then additionally, we have a huge Vietnamese population. We have lots of other um, immigrant populations here. So how do we really talk about all of that um, and helping communities live with water, especially when we're thinking about indigenous communities, which are at the root of that. Um, so the urban water plan was really important to starting the conversation. As I mentioned, we never had the conversation about that. I, growing up here and many other people from New Orleans would always say we saw the levees and the number one thing that we would hear is we want to keep the water out, keep the water down, and that's all we really talked about. And with Katrina, the dependency on gray infrastructure um, failed us. And that's really the root of it is that it wasn't uh, people who failed, it wasn't communities who failed, it was government that failed, it was the system that failed. And how do we correct that? And the one way we did that is by having a conversation about putting it into our hands, community hands, to really propel this conversation forward. So while professionals were at the root of developing the urban water plan and the concepts and the values of living when thriving with water, they also really understood that this wasn't going to be a process led by Army Corps of Engineers or FEMA or HUD or the city of New Orleans or the state of Louisiana. It was going to be a movement led by the people who live through these uh, hurricanes and storms and rain events every single day. Um, and as residents get more frustrated um, from uh, cloud bursts where they see you know, seven to sometimes 12 inches of rain, even more in some cases at a time in a short amount of hours, it has to be residents that have to be the driving force behind that. And so when we're thinking about uh, the Dutch dialogues and the urban water plan, and here we are right now, we're seeing almost a, a billion dollars come down, especially with the Infrastructure Jobs Act, um, coming down for community resilience. And as we've learned is when community actually creates the solutions, when they're a part of a de de development of these ideas, obviously um, the landscape architects and engineers and contractors do the, 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 the implementation, but if we are the ones creating the work, then the work is more likely to succeed because when we create it, we know what it means, we understand it, and we have buy-in. We continue to maintain it. Um, and that was the problem with the gray infrastructure. We never had a voice in where these levees went or where the drainage system went or how it worked. And then when it failed, it failed because we didn't know how to maintain it as residents. And we really see the educational component to Allison's question is it's important for residents to understand why these systems have failed and the solutions to that failure and how we can see New Orleans in the future or Louisiana in the future. It's not really just about, you know, A plus B equals C, right? You know, there's bioswales and, you know, there's, you know, all kinds of stormwater management systems that we could talk about. It's not just the structural component of it, it's the community component of it and how do communities really uh, work together to maintain these systems. And so when we're educating residents, we're not just talking about the physical structure, we're talking about the history and our relationship with it. We understand that the relationship with gray infrastructure is much more than science, it's cultural. 
And a lot of the relationships we, we have with our infrastructure is rooted in our history. For a small example, uh, you know, a lot of residents during Katrina and other hurricanes always say they blew up the levees, right? And some people believe it fully and some people don't. But people also don't know that the history behind blowing levees uh, dates back all the way to enslavement where plantation owners would make enslaved people uh, create and build levees. And then the enslavers would then blow each other's levees up because they don't really understand watershed. They weren't scientists. But that trauma has actually gone on for many, many years. And then in the flood of 1927, they blew up the levees in St. Bernard Parish. And then they also blew the levees in Hurricane Betsy to protect the French Quarter um, as the uh, Mr. Go uh, swelled, which is a Mississippi River Gulf outlet, which is now closed after Hurricane Katrina. All of those things have caused trauma. And so when you're talking about residents and how they experience climate change, they're not just experiencing, well, this thing happened and it rained today. They're actually experiencing decades and years of trauma. And so when we're talking about education, it's not just a physical curriculum style education. It's about addressing climate trauma. It's about addressing cultural traditions. And it's also um, about bringing residents to the table instead of, and, and actually not bringing the tables, bringing them there, bringing the table to them. Let me correct myself, bringing the table to them because it's more important for them to, to know that they not only can be at the table, but they can command the table. And when they command the table, then our communities will be successful. I, I could keep asking you guys questions, but I know there's many people in the audience today that would like to also ask you questions. And um, I believe Rich, I'll hand it back to Rich um, and Audubon have a few comments as all, also to make about their work. Yeah, well, thank you, Allison and, and Jessica and Robin, and, and thanks for all of you for the amazing and wonderful and critical work that you do. And it's great to hear about. Um, we'll be opening up for question and answers um, from, the, uh, from our audience in a few minutes. So please drop them in the chat if you have any questions. Uh, but also joining us right now is Ken Elkins, uh, Audubon's Community Conservation Manager. Uh, Ken, you work um, largely with uh, Audubon's bird-friendly community initiatives. What type of projects are you and, and Audubon working on that relate to what we just heard about? Thanks, Rich. And uh, thanks, Allison, Jessica, and Robin for sharing. Uh, I think our team has got a lot more to learn, but I wanted to share how uh, our team in Connecticut, I work in bird friendly communities where we believe that everyone can have a P, uh, play a role in conservation and we are thinking of ways that we can support birds by providing food shelter and safe passage where we share spaces with them. And if you see on the right there, all of our uh, strategic priorities for Audubon's work climate we're realizing that uh, resiliency is becoming a part of every other uh, area of our strategic priorities. And uh, a couple of examples of that, our COASTS team has an uh, office at Stratford Point where we partner with uh, Sacred Heart University is working on a living shorelines project. So it's one that you can come and see. And uh, we also have teams on both sides of Long Island Sound working on sh uh, marshland restoration projects. Robin was talking about uh, creating habitat for Ridgeway's rails, that is fun to say. Uh, we're looking for salt marsh sparrow habitat in Connecticut. So uh, this marsh right now is being uh, 30 acres of it is uh, getting restored and we're connecting with the city, having high st school students being involved in uh, the replanting of the grasses and uh, reconnecting other community groups to see that this area behind the warehouses isn't just wasteland, but it's really valuable and birders from all over the state come because this is some of the prime habitat uh, right here in their own neighborhoods. And I would be remiss not to talk about my colleagues in policy, both in Hartford and in Albany and in DC, uh, where they are having constant conversations with our legislators of how we can find more funding for resiliency projects. Uh, and being very creative in ways that we can find it in other areas. Some of those Jessica talked about in DC in particular, uh, but we have uh, work in Hartford on bills specifically for climate uh, restoration work. Our centers in Connecticut and New York connect people with nature. And Jessica was saying that everyone, uh, if they are more comfortable with it, they feel one with nature or one with the water. And one thing that our centers do is connect with their local communities and find ways to appreciate their local nature that if they don't have their own why of 
uh, why nature is important to their lives and adds value to their neighborhood, those uh, individuals don't want to participate. And what we're looking for instead at Audubon is what are some activities during our programs and ways they engage with nature that are going to uh, inspire future behavior change and giving them the opportunity in Syracuse to replant uh, and remove invasives under an area that during the winter ends up hosting one of the largest overwintering populations of bald eagles. Uh, so they have pride in their city as they're able to help restore their habitats around them. The work that I, our team in BFC in Connecticut in particular works on is urban oases that we are developing partnerships with some of the normal players in the environment like Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, Yale University School of Forestry, but also connecting them with groups that we aren't what people normally consider part of the conservation movement and providing them with the tools that they can study nature in their own areas and uh, providing them with funds for starting their own habitat restoration projects. While the city of New Haven's waiting for all the funding and permits to be able to have a huge uh, living shoreline in their harbor, we have a growing grassroots effort in the city to reconnect people with nature and uh, making each neighborhood have more resilient connections as well. So uh, what I wanted to uh, also do is start to share some of the questions from our group today. And uh, first of all, I have for Robin is that we have uh, joining us today, someone who is a coastal marsh scientist. And <clears throat> they were wondering if uh, you have any uh, support of how these marshes can uh, uh, be resilient to sea level rise, that it's going to increase more than what we have as the current level in these uh, marsh restoration projects. So how do you see the future of those working out? Yeah, I really appreciate that question. It's something we are very concerned about as well. It's, um, and we actually just published a, a big report, multi-year effort for last year called Sediment for Survival, um, which is about exactly this topic in our region about how much sediment do we need um, to allow our marshes to continue to persist and, um, and where, where might it come from? Like, where, where, what are the sources? Um, and just to step back, I guess it's like to, to explain the, the, the issue here. Um, tidal marshes, you know, these marshes that exist, you know, around sea level um, have this really amazing ability to calibrate themselves to changing sea levels over, you know, in, in nature, you know, sea level has been changing for thousands of years. Um, and if it changes within a modest enough rate uh, of speed and there's enough dirt in the water, um, marshes are extremely resilient to sea level rise. Um, they get flooded a little bit more when the sea level rises and more, and then more dirt from the water settles out onto them and they're able to grow up faster. Um, and if sea level goes down a little, they, um, you know, they can gradually go down. So they are inherently very resilient. Um, they also can move inland. Um, if it's a flat area and the sea level rises, that makes new areas available. Um, but we have reduced their both mechanisms of resilience and natural resilience, right? They generally don't have anywhere to go inland because they run into a levee or a seawall of some kind. And they generally don't have, we have reduced the amount of sediment that is generally available to marshes because, and that's because of reservoirs that are unintentionally capturing the sediment uh, behind reservoirs. It's not any good for us. It fills up the reservoirs, making them have less water. Um, so it's a, it's a fundamental problem um that is challenging to fix um, because it's sort of how our whole landscape is plumbed and and, and our kind of intertwined with our water management systems so but in this report and i know other people are developing similar strategies we evaluate what are all the different how much sediment do we need to keep our marshes growing especially since we want to make more marshes um and where might be able to get that and that leads to a number of strong recommendations um, from things like changing our policies around dredging. Um, we actually do are constantly digging up dirt in the bay to make passage for large ships, um, you know, for commerce. Um, we could be reusing that sediment more directly instead of dumping it off and out far, far ashore, um, offshore, um, to 
um, so reuse of sediment to then trying to change the operations of reservoirs so they're actually able to let sediment through um, or even removing some strategic reservoirs as is starting to happen and releasing sediment behind them. So I do, ag I agree with the, the comment that really it's those big moves that are fundamentally going to make our marshes also moving back in places so the marshes have a place to go that are really the long-term solution. There's a lot of things we're doing kind of that are more immediate, short, midterm solutions. And the trick is how do we do those and be starting to make the bigger things happen at the same time. Thanks, Robin. I got a question for Jessica, but before I do, I just want, I'm gonna drop in the chat the, um, uh, you can order uh, Allison's book that features both Jessica and Robin's work, as well as many others in, uh, on, this, on this subject. And uh, we have a 30% discount if you use the, um, the discount code there too, that we've arranged. So uh, I'll add that in the chat, just lest I forget before the end. But Jessica, I had a question earlier. It said, you said education is an important com component of your initiatives. And so what are the mechanisms for the wholesale education, I think you called it, for the residents you referenced? And a recent question is kind of a, uh, corollary to that, it said, you know, please share cultural strategies for bringing voices to the table who have been historically marginalized in, in these endeavors. So. Yeah, absolutely. I can just share a few examples uh, that things that we're working on. So the first thing um, is we actually have a tour company, uh, a tour arm of the Water Club have called Green Tours. Uh, and I should say Green Tours, I would say Blue Tours, but that was our branding strategist. So, um, but the uh, Green Tours actually is a, we offer three different types of tours. One is a, a three hour walking tour on the Mississippi River where we go, we start at, um, we start uh, down river and move our way up and we go from past to present. So we actually talk about the development of the Mississippi uh, River Delta to the development of New Orleans and the economy around that. And then we go all the way up to now where we talk about climate change, um, the impacts of the petrochemical industry, um, and then also, uh, uh, ongoing policy work that we're working on. And the point of that, again, is the wholesale education. So we don't wanna just reach New Orleans residents, we also wanna reach, reach visitors. When people often think of New Orleans, they think of uh, you know Bourbon Street and Mardi Gras beads and Dumbo, which is great. But we also want people to leave knowing that New Orleans also, our, our social, economic, and cultural impact has everything to do with our, our, our climate and our water than anything else. Um, we also have a self-guided bike tour that talks about uh, the built environment in, in Hurricane Katrina. And we also do custom tours for school groups and conferences where we take them not only to uh, specific sites in New Orleans, but we take them outside of New Orleans to do uh, different projects such as volunteer work, kayaking in the, uh, in the uh, swamps uh, and, and so on. Additionally, we have a, a, uh, an arts program. We have an artist collective, which we're currently launching, but we've been working with many of these artists already where we use art and culture as a way to talk about climate change. Um, one of the things that here in New Orleans is we always laugh is people really don't pay attention unless there's music involved. Um, and so how do we really get people to know about this work? So for example, Pontchartrain Park is a historic uh, African-American neighborhood built uh, in the 19, uh, I believe it's the 1960s. Um, and, that, and that community um, was, even though they built it uh, almost duplicate to a white neighborhood nearby, um, it was a uh, strip of trees, um, it didn't have any of the uh, ecological needs that needed the biodiversity that is, you know, that you think of when you think of a prosperous neighborhood. So we're working with Seoul, who I mentioned earlier, sustaining our urban landscape, um, and two artists to actually bring uh, hand uh, hand drawn posters to every committee member. Where one side is a beautiful poster that talks about um, uh, the the importance of trees and green infrastructure to the community. We're also doing a, a multimedia wheat pasting, uh, uh, sorry, uh, why well, I can't get the word out, mural. <laughs> We're doing a wheat pasting mural um, in the community that does actually does the same thing and we talk about that. And then I'll also say that we're working on a communication strategy with a lot of our artists. So thinking about artists, cultural bearers and influencers um, and how do we have these conversations with not only young people, but everybody in these conversations. And then lastly, um, when we do tons of workshops, particularly around workforce development, and the biggest group that we're trying to reach is our low income residents, formerly incarcerated because they can actually be a part of this new economy. They can be a part of this new reality of New Orleans, especially 
and entry level work. And so a lot of the work we're doing is actually uh, educating them and helping create a curriculum with uh, some of our other partners, um, working on procurement and workforce development, and then actually making sure they're part of the long-term strategy. So that's just a snippet I can go on and on and on. I'm trying to be thoughtful of time. I know we have one minute left, but that we do it in a multi multitude of ways because we realize that we have to reach different communities in different ways. Yeah, that's a lot of information. So yeah, it's it's it's, it's no surprise that it takes a little while to describe. Um, we only have time for one more question today, but if you do have questions out there that we haven't gotten to, I will drop um, some emails in the chat where you can send to us and we will follow up with you. And um, Ken, go ahead. Uh, so today we've heard that lots of different organizations can be involved in resiliency projects depending on the community that's involved. But uh, I don't know if any of our panelists today could share, maybe Allison, because you did the most research on this, or Robin, because you work with them. Is there a uh, specific municipal group that is always involved office type that people could look to? Because we have questions in the chat about New York City and other communities. What's going on in my area? How could they find that information a little bit easier? Okay. Um, well, the book covers nine cities throughout the country and, um, and multiple kinds of projects in, in many of them. So I, I would definitely plug the book as a way of understanding what's going on in the cities that it, that it discusses. In general, um, what I found in my research that often it's a combination of, you know, grassroots community-based groups, government, people in government that are that are working alongside them and advocacy groups. So, you know, it seems to be a blend of things and often finding one inroads in through one organization leads you to another, which is actually how I found uh, Jessica and many of her colleagues in, in New Orleans is through the um, some, some of the organizations that they've been working with. So, you know, often people are connected to each other's work and ideas and, and that also, um, uh, is true across the country as well as people learn from examples in one city and take best practices and apply them to another. Um, so I, I would look there um, in, in each city. And then there's uh, national networks like USDN um, that are great at um, providing sort of government leadership on sustainability, the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. Um, and that's a, that's a great way of following kind of how best practices in forming lots of different cities, both from you know, smaller cities to large scale cities. Well, thanks. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. It's a great discussion and I'm afraid to, I'm sad to cut it off, but um, thanks everyone for joining us today. And thanks so much to Allison and to Robin and Jessica for joining us and to Ken and for today's wonderful presentation and chat. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please follow up. And uh, this has been recorded and an email will be going out in the next few days um, with a link to the recording and, and um, some of the other links from the work that we're talking about and the, and the book. Um, we'll, we'll hope you all join us for our next webinar. It'll be on uh, April 20th as uh, Dan Rochelle from the National Resources Defense Council will present on the impact of neonic pesticides and, and what we can do about it. Thanks everyone. Thank you all.